Um, so I've got a little bit of time, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and get it right into it. Um, so the, the origin of my talk today is a simple search in the library and information science technology database, right? Um, I was interested in researching a project um, on political economy in LIS, and I started plugging in the names of the big dead dudes, right? Your Marxes, your Keynes's. Um, and I stumbled across this address that uh, John Kenneth Galbraith delivered to the President's Program at ALA Annual in 1979 um, in Dallas, Texas. It was published in the American Libraries of that year. Um, and I think it's really interesting as a historical document, and I think I want to examine it more as a primary source historical document for thinking about the ways that um, we talk about these issues have maybe changed or maybe they haven't in the intervening 38 years. Um, 1979 is a real, I think, crucial moment, uh, particularly in Western liberal democracies, because a lot of the dialogue and discourse about uh, capitalism and markets and society was shifting along with the centers of uh, political power. Right now, Galbraith begins his piece by stating we are now in the second year of our great conservative revolt. Now, whether or not we agree with that, you know, 1977 is the origin of that is a you know separate question. Um, you know, whatever that, but I think it's inarguable that uh, this kind of uh, sensibility in American politics has been a defining feature of the past 40 years. I, you know, I'd argue that Trumpism is its apotheosis. Right, putting aside that question of Trumpism for the moment, if at all possible, right. The, you know, the act of posing questions about libraries and their relationship to capitalism represented in the call for today's event really strikes me as an attempt to name and describe something that librarianship hasn't talked a lot about directly um, since I entered the profession 12 years ago, right? There are exceptions, and I don't want to um, exclude those. So, but before I really get into the question of uh, Galbraith's piece, I do want to sort of um, examine this bigger question of capitalism. Absol By the way, uh, this is completely, oh, the animations. I just did a search for money in Microsoft <laughs> PowerPoint, and I thought this, this was good, right? Um, now, we all experience capitalism in a myriad of ways, right? It's this general way of describing um, kind of the social, political, economic systems that we live under, right? I'm online with my cable company. I'm going to, capitalism, uh, Right, I'm at Costco, I find a good deal on cargo shorts. This is a highly personalized example. <laughs> I'm like, cool, right? Capitalism, right? It's cheap shorts. There's a lot of else going, I don't know. But I think if we're gonna think seriously and rigorously about it, particularly as librarians who wanna build um, our power as library workers and as uh, institutions, we have to understand that um, capitalism right now is a very specific one, right? In the United States in particular. Um, and there's an entire literature in political economy called the varieties of capitalism that sort of examines um, how the system works in different uh, polities in different contexts in different countries. So, um, you know, we, so it's a variable system. Um, I stumbled upon this definition of capitalism by the historian um, Ellen Meiskens Wood, who defines capitalism as a system in which all major economic actors are dependent on the market for their basic requirements of life. Other societies have had markets, often on a large scale, but only in capitalism is market dependence a fundamental condition of life for everyone. I mean, people can contest this, right? Well, libraries are not a requirement of life in the way that healthcare, food, and housing are. I do think education, culture, and information are crucial public goods that enable the social pre uh, reproduction of people, of workers, right, uh, that make capitalism go. So what I like about Wood's definition is that, um, is that you know, it shifts our attention away from what to the uninitiated might seem like these really dry kind of conversations about, say, the difference between fiscal and, econo um, you know, fiscal and monetary policy um, to these more fundamental existential questions, right, about who gets what and whether or not what people get provides them with a decent and fulfilling life, right? So I think now, every day in our libraries, at our reference desks, in our classrooms, right, when we work with patrons and sort of we experience the austerity that we're all, we can all talk about, right, um, just after, you know, uh, I'm sure during this event, right, we do feel, I think, to quote the call for today's event, that we live in a cultural environment in which profit is all important. We're experiencing a real crisis, I think, in the system. And I don't know how, how, what the best way is to talk about it, right? Now, if you took an e economics class as an undergraduate, right, um, I don't know if people are familiar, um, you know, if you, you probably would have um, not seen a definition of capitalism like the one I just provided, right? Because economics is dominated by a particular um, kind of tradition within economics called neoclassical economics. People can quibble with this, 
right? But it really focuses on how supply and demand um, influence the behavior of this homo economicus, right? This assumed to be rational utility maximizing actor. Um, Barbara Pfister kind of talked about this a little bit in her presentation as well. Um, so, you know, if you're the kind of person who likes graphs and charts, right? You open up a textbook, um, you might be very excited, but you know, you're not, most people are not, right? So it becomes, it looks like it's this sort of dry kind of thing that doesn't have much to do with our day-to-day -day lives. Um, however, you know, I became interested in this sort of broader tradition of political economy that has a lot of um, sort of a heterodox approach, right, that examines um, political and social in institutions, right, um, morality and ideology as all things that determine economic events, right? So that brings me to the subject of today's talk, right, this uh, John Kenneth Galbraith piece, because he is a key figure in uh, political economy. Um, so, but, um, right. Now, as I said, I won't contest the power of neoclassical economics as an explanatory tool, right? It is very powerful. Um, but I think one of the most sort of pernicious things about its dominance is that it emphasized this idea that there is something sort of natural or neutral about a singular market separate from society, right? So instead, you know, I think we should really think about how um, markets are always embedded in society, right? And that they're constantly sort of movements um, of people trying to contest them and resist this kind of domination of day-to-day -day life. Um, anyways, so on to Galbraith. Um, it's a four-page article in American Libraries Magazine, 1979. You could look it up. Um, it's right there in the, um, it's right there um, in the Lista uh, database if you subscribe. Um, and, you know, so pretty, uh, Pretty accessible if you have access to that. Now, um, I think it's important to note he was a very powerful figure, right? He was the ambassador to India under JFK. He played a huge role in developing uh, uh, LBJ's New Society programs, right? Um, I would say that um, probably no other sort of economist or sort of public figure better exemplifies what I would call the social democratic tendencies in post-war American liberal liberalism and its contradictions and issues, which we can talk about later, better than Galbraith, right? He, he, he was on um, television very frequently. Uh, he, you can find on YouTube some of these economic history uh, PBS shows he, he delivered. He, anyways, powerful guy. But, um, so he had this theory um, uh, outlined in the Affluent Society, one of his key works, about social balance, right? And I think it's actually a pretty straightforward um, kind of theory, and I think we will recognize it kind of quickly, that this unwavering philosophical commitment um, to private goods at the expense of public infrastructure, for example, schools, roads, clean air, and libraries, right, leads to what he called a ruinous situation of private opulence and public squalor. Uh, uh, he argues that as large corporate firms grow and consolidate power, they develop this kind of broader techno structure um, in which a host of technicians, engineers, lawyers, and economists exert influence over the political system and structure an economy in which the public sector will inevitably be perceived as quote unquote inferior. Way back in 58, 1958, um, as Galbraith put it, the scientist, the engineer, the advertiser who develops a new carburetor, cleanser, or depilatory, that was a new word for me, um, for which the public recognizes no need and will feel none until an advertising campaign arouses its interest, is a valued member of our society. A politician or public servant who dreams up a public service is a wastrel. So, um, I do think in our libraries this is something we can understand intuitively, right, for our not we d experience it directly, right? When we encounter uh, patrons who need to apply for jobs uh, online using the internet, um, you know, there was no sort of consideration as to um, how that would happen. We can see this in even public services, right? As things move to kind of uh, uh, online environment, right? There was no investment in the infrastructure that would make sure these, uh, the, that, um, that that kind of application process could be under, undergone, right? Um, so that continues what I think of as a bifurcation between those who can afford private resources that are subjected to market forces and those who rely on public resources like uh, a lot of public libraries or uh, public universities. So even the most talented, uh, you know, resilient and gritty librarian will have a tough time competing with the army of engineers at Google, right? 
leaving aside these sort of bar, you know, privacy questions, right? So, from, so for Galbraith, this is something that's sort of embedded in our economic system, right? Social imbalance arises from this increase in the production and consumption of private goods that's not matched by the public infrastructure services required by their use, right? So, um, so this gets us to the, um, the article, right? Galbraith's solution, um, and in this, uh, it's four, as I said, I think it's four pages. Here are the um, commandments, right? Uh, defend, now a lot of these are pretty common sense and I think as people who work in libraries, we kind of know this already, so we didn't need, <laughs> right? We didn't need, yeah. So um, defend public services, um, you know, I'll quote directly, public services not in any respect are inferior to private goods or services. Let us all say this plainly, the children of the rich can buy books, the poor cannot. Um, let this said be often and with emphasis, right? Take a stand on collective decision. Uh, by collective decision, he means the sort of collective willpower, for example, through taxation to support collective resources rather than sort of a conception of individual liberty to be free from, from being taxed, right? So collective decision, this idea as a community, we get together, we decide to collectively um, support something, right? Um, uh, resist inflation, absolutely a relic of the 70s, right? This is a longer discussion, but um, the economic crisis that we've been experiencing since 2008, I think most people would agree, is a deflationary crisis rather than inflationary. Um, that's um, it's a much longer discussion, but we can kind of set that aside. Seek federal support, um, I would say absolutely. Um, I think particularly in education, um, the kind of localism that exists in this country um, has really been, uh, as the previous presenter kind of outlined, I think the localism in terms of s funding public institutions has really exacerbated inequality um, in all sorts of ways. So, I mean, easier said than done, right? Um, but uh, make librarians seem dangerous uh, as a political force. That's a great idea. I'm sure we'd all agree, right? Um, so, uh, you know, but I think it's sort of, you know, we, I guess, and um, now this last one, he said, become more efficient. So, um, you know, to counteract these kinds of stereotypes about inefficient public servants, I think, you know, he's sort of saying, do your job really efficiently, you know, kind of giving this rallying cry. I would, I think that there's a lot more to the stereotype of public servants as inefficient that's sort of embedded in a, a kind of complicated, uh, not complicated, but stereotypes, um, particularly, uh, you know, this sort of, uh, um, yeah, we can get into that. But um, so there they are, right? Um, so I think they're, you know, they're not bad commandments. I don't know what, if you think that, right? As, I mean, they're not, you know, revel revelatory. Um, I think, well, his commandments are interesting. Um, in my opinion, they do fail to develop um, a sufficient framework for addressing the conjuncture of crises in capitalism that we are currently confronting, right? His um, concept, um, of countervailing power, which was uh, this sort of idea that um, as, uh, pub as citizens became more educated, particularly during the post-war period, uh, you know, more people would, you know, obtain kind of white-collar office jobs that they would sort of join with uh, organized labor and the state to sort of counteract this power of corporate concentration. Um, but you know, I think he's very inattentive to kind of how, uh, and so his concept requires a lot of consensus, right? A kind of overlapping consensus of all these sort of rational actors. And I think he was really inattentive to how well class consciousness and the civil rights revolutions of the 60s and 70s and particularly the backlash to those revolutions um, have shaped the way these issues are framed. Um, so I think getting real quickly as I could sort of conclude, um, I think there's um, a political theorist, Nancy Frazier, has been talk arguing that we're currently con experiencing sort of three interrelated crises. One is this crisis of what she calls financialized capitalism, um, which sort of uh, is sort of the, uh, the kind of cap the, pr the issues that say of capital accumulation that Marx um, analyzed way back in the 19th century. A second, environmental crisis, right, that threatens our ability to exist on the pl planet. And third, what she calls a crisis of care or a crisis of social reproduction, which is that these sort of background institutions that um, allow for workers to exist in capitalism, right? You got 
you can only um, you know you can only be worked so long right during the day you got to go home you got to rest um, people need to be taken care of um, you know the house tr housework needs to be done historically all these things were unwaged but they were absolutely necessary for capitalism to work right this sort of unwaged labor um, um, and sort of precarious labor, labor um, and the sort of historical conditions in which library, uh, sh libra American public librarianship progressed that uh, Barbara Fister outlined earlier, I think really points to this, right? There's a crisis in this realm, right? Th in that um, I think it's becoming um, commodified, absolutely, for those who can afford to pay for it and privatized for those who cannot, right? So there's, there's an, so I would really think that as librarians, um, we got to kind of understand, at least in my opinion, that the continual attacks on public services demanded by the advocates of austerity look remarkably similar, whether you're in Puerto Rico, Greece, or Kansas, right? You want to create a friendly business environment, um, and you slash taxes for the wealthy. And this crisis is something we're really, I think, experiencing. Um, however, I do think that, now, for example, if we were to withdraw our labor tomorrow as librarians, um, we would not precipitate a crisis in capitalism. Let's be honest, right? Um, it would, you know, we don't even exist in the way that, say, you know, manufacturing labor did in the 1930s, right? There's a whole, right? We're in a different kind of um, state. So I really think that um, sort of developing, um, so, you know, solidaristic bonds with uh, kind of other people in the public sector, other workers, other social movements, um, whether it's sort of with teachers, uh, medical care workers, uh, social movements, um, and unions, whether they be kind of formal institution, uh, formal structures, or kind of new social movements like Black Lives Matter, the movement for Medicare for All. You know, there's this kind of interconnected uh, state of kind of upheaval, but it's sort of bringing these kinds of disparate struggles together and thinking about how us as librarians can be a part of these kind of movements, given that we're situated in particular institutions and that we do actually have power within those institutions and a certain amount of authority. So that's about all I have, I'm out of time. Um, so those are just my initial thoughts. Um, I'd be curious to hear yours, but um, anyways, thank you. Yeah.